Buddhism in the 21st century has become increasingly globalized. Therefore, a discussion that at once transcends nations and cultures, while drawing upon the rich tapestry of Buddhist diversity, will offer a unique opportunity to exchange perspectives on the changes and challenges for Buddhism today. The opportunity for creative discussions and shared explorations of Buddhist insights from different parts of the world will pave the way for future collaborations in shaping and propagating the timeless Buddhist values. Building a transnational and cross-cultural network of Buddhist communities is therefore considered a vital link in this process. In line with addressing this concern and realizing this potential, an international Buddhist conference on globalized Buddhism, titled Buddhism Without Borders, was held in the sacred settings of Buntang Zongkhag in Bhutan, the last standing Vajrayana kingdom and a bastion of living Buddhist traditions. The conference opened on the 21st of May this year. A luminary of eminent scholars, practitioners and members of the international Buddhist community selected on the basis of their work and academic credentials engage in a process of intense yet wholesome exchange of visions, dreams, ideas and creativity on pre-selected aspects of Buddhism. The conference was thus categorized into six themes. As a leader in the field of cultural and religious studies in Bhutan and the region, the Center for Bhutan Studies are the organizers of the conference in their continuing effort to bolster the critical position of Bhutan as the Mecca of the Buddhist world. The conference featured plenary presentations by keynote guest speakers, followed by thematic parallel discussions and participant interactions. At the end of the conference, the papers presented during the conference will be published as part of the proceedings. Thank you. I would first like to acknowledge and thank the Center for Bhutan Studies for hosting this um, conference and for the opportunity as participants to, um, through pilgrimage and um, our visit here to really witness Buddhism as both a system for living and as a li living system, which is what I'm wanting to address somewhat in my paper today. I would also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge my teacher, Venerable Trudlig Kapkon Rinpoche, who lived in Bhutan um, for five years in eastern Bhutan, so it's very meaningful for me to be here. So I thank you for that opportunity also. So this presentation today in is concerned with the notion of Buddhism as a living tradition and really arises from my reflections as a Buddhist practitioner for nearly 20 years within the Tibetan tradition. Within this, I have learned that Buddhism is primarily a practical endeavor concerned with understanding experience and transforming experience through that understanding. 
On the one hand, I have wrestled with what presents as dense philosophy to do with questions of causality, ca causality, ontology, and epistemology to apply those terms. And on the other hand, or indeed simultaneously, I have seen, in fact, how these inquiries are concerned with aspects of our lived experience as human beings. I've come to appreciate these two dimensions, philosophy and application, as not separate endeavours, but referenced directly through and to our own human experience. Further, not only have I found Buddhism directly applicable to lived experience, but it also presents to me as a living tradition, with firm roots in its traditional past and relevant to my own contemporary experience. In the ways I have experienced Buddhism, I have found no contradiction or tension within this. I have seen how this has challenged not only my own, but also more generally held views of Buddhism when conceived from the perspective of being a religious tradition, which of course remains a contentious categorization of the teachings of the Buddha. Reflecting on these experiences as representative of how many Westerners engaging with Buddhism through traditional teachers, especially from the tra Tibetan traditions, this paper considers how Buddhism presents in the contemporary Western context as a living tradition. This perspective serves to highlight not only the very nature of what Buddhism is and where it comes from, but also challenges a number of Western perceptions about Buddhism, Buddhists and traditions. I suggest that the living tradition perspective is one in which lived experience is understood to be the singularity within Buddhism. I borrow this notion of singularity from Wolfries, who utilizes it in relation to Derrida's writing in counter, encountering misconceptions of the use of the concept of deconstruction. So singularity, he suggests, is understood to function as that which unifies a tradition or body of work in that singularity is what all within a tradition both bears witness to and demonstrates responsibility toward. Thus, from the living tradition perspective, lived experience is the sustained and abiding concern within Buddhism, which functions as the singularity to unify it both in space and time and across space and time. Further, it is this singularity of lived experience which unifies enlightened and, in ordin and ordinary experiences as kinds of human experiences, which I will endeavor to speak more on. The singularity of li lived experience, it can be said then that within a living tradition perspective, the mind of the practitioner functions for the continuity of the tradition, wherein the living component is reflected in the subject subjectivity of practitioners conditioned by space and time. Thus, it is also by necessity that Buddhism was always contemporary, since it is referenced through lived experience. This living tradition perspective is represented as a contrast to a number of dominant Western perspectives on Buddhism, which can be described as weighted towards emphasizing Buddhism as a non-Western product, as a heterogeneous ent entity, and as a tradition in diametric opposition to innovation. It is suggested that clarifying these differences is helpful to pave the way for a Buddhism without Buddha borders, demonstrating that in fact Buddhism challenges many borders imposed on it by Western perceptions. For example, between text and practice, between tradition and innovation, between ancient and contemporary. My hope is that the living tradition perspective is in fact an assertion of what Buddhism is, what its purpose is and how to understand its doctrine and as a consequence, more uh, clearly articulate its application within the contemporary world. Within the contemporary Western context, it is evident that many diasporic traditional Buddhist teachers are cognizant of presenting Buddhism in a way both relevant and sensitive to contemporary Western needs, while introducing the traditional or essential teaching and practices to witness Westerners. Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, for example, has been described as being extremely concerned about how to present Dharma without distorting or diluting it, yet in a way that would be relevant to the modern world. Such a perspective can be described in the service of establishing a Buddhism which is totally familiar with the modern world, yet at the same time not completely divorced from its traditional roots. Trilid Kapkon Rinpoche, for example, has called this a neo-orthodoxy. At the same time, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been said to affirm in the context of the Western brain sciences that if elements of Buddhist doctrine are compellingly refuted by new empirical evidence or cogent reasoning, then these Buddhist tenets must be abandoned. 
Fundamentally, Buddhists themselves agree Buddhism changes without losing its essential elements. This view forms the basis for the living tradition perspective in which Buddhism can be described as a system on the one hand that is neither dogmatically contested nor on the other hand somehow relativistically benign. These two li aspects, living and tradition, serve in fact to support a balanced middle way view within which the notion of tradition is understood to reflect both orthodoxy and orthopraxy and the subsequent perpetuation of such a content of beliefs and practices deemed fundamental or essential in the identification of both Buddhism and a Buddhist, wherein the counterpoint of living not only highlights the deba debate and controversy within existing within the tradition and its engagement with outside philosophical, cultural and religious traditions, but more importantly signifies the contingency and plasticity of form in terms of expression, example and performance of those beliefs and practices within the context of human subjectivity and space and time. That is, understanding, to re reiterate here, that Buddhism is derived from hum human experience, this thus situates it as necessarily subject to human beingness. For indeed, for it to be otherwise would be contrary to the fundamentals not only of its beliefs, where here people may often argue impermanence, but contrary in fact to what it is. Thus the living tradition perspective seeks to challenge the view that traditional Buddhist teachers are primarily writing and teaching in ways that reflect the contemporary Western context because of their willingness to reach beyond the historical horizons of the text and boundaries of their own culture as Cabazzoni suggests when he referring to, the, for example, the Dalai Lama. This view, I suggest, overdetermines Buddhism as a non-Western cultural product at the expense of the foundation for what we call Buddhism, human experience. In contrast, a living tradition perspective understands that traditional teachers like the Dalai Lama are writing and teaching responsive to the context in which Buddhism and they, th they themselves are in because of what Buddhism is and concomitantly as can be said, where it exists. Buddhism, from the perspective of Buddhism, can be said to exist in minds which perceive and conceptualize it, minds which are conditioned concomitantly by the functions and processes of the mental factors and by the socio-historical context and conditions with which minds in persons are situated. I have explored elsewhere a Buddhist mind and mental factors reading of Buddhism in coming into Western consciousness in the 19th century. However, the living tradition perspective understands Buddhism in space and time as a general category from within which Buddhism in the contemporary Western context is only so as an instance or particular as it is in all other contexts in which it has taken roots. As an instance, when we consider, Buddhism, uh, we consider the Western um, contemporary context, we find Buddhism simply in relation to contemporary subjective experience in the context of modern life characterized in the broad brush strokes of consumerism, secularism, individualism, skepticism and rationalism through which con contemporary Western minds tend in their intending upon Buddhism. This perspective highlights the necessary mutuality or interdependency of Buddhism and human beings, even suggesting of course a borderless relationship as Buddhism itself arises from within our, our lived experiences. When considered in relation to the teachings, scriptures or dharma, Buddhism of course pre presents in diverse forms demonstrating distinctive character and influence. On the one hand, some teachings deal with the dharma on an abstract, philosophical or even theological level, and on the other hand, others deal with the dharma in more practical, spiritual and in inspirational ways. Within the Western context, it has become almost a truism to say that, of course, there is not just one there is not just one Buddhism, but Buddhisms distinguished and distinguishable in terms of geography, historical time, and/or doctrine, resulting in the conceptualization of Buddhism as a primarily multifaceted entity, and within which Western Buddhist studies have historically divided the study of Buddhism in these ways and continues to contest the classifications. However, from a living tradition perspective, it may be argued that plurality may have become overdetermined in our contemporary conceptualization of Buddhism at the expense of lived experience as the singular concern across the diversity of Buddhism. This notion of the singularity in a body of work or tradition finds resonance within the field of comparative religion, where Schafstein su has suggested that the notion of a unity of a tradition 
is used to refer to that which prevails over all the internal differences a religion may exhibit. This unity, he suggests, is demonstrates in two ways, through continuity and self-reference. Continuity is the relationship that makes everything subsequent in the tradition lead back to the same beginning in time, place, or attitude. Self-reference is the quality that makes an isolated statement or philosophy difficult to understand without setting it in the contextual web that determines what is internal to the tradition and what is external to, the, to it. Thus, I suggest the singularity of human experience functions as both the continuity and self-reference in Buddhism. With human experience as the data which forms the content of Buddhism, it is linked to both the inside of the out and outside of tradition through living practitioners. This perspective of the singularity of Buddhism pro proceeds from and gives primacy, of course, to um, the Buddha as a human being. He neither claimed to be a god or an incarnation of some higher being, or indeed an intermediary between some higher reality and human beings. He was a human being within the context of his own time and place, his own station within that, and who on the basis of his own experiences set out to find ways to understand and deal with the facts of human suffering and to find methods that would help bring about stable and substantial happiness in human life. His singular interest was directed to that which was useful and beneficial to such endeavors. His teachings are the result of such a quest and record the discovery of the natural truths he found in relation to his own experiences. In this way, Buddhism is a tradition established in a, by a category of revelations sourced in human experience, as says Samdong Rinpoche. In this way, the teachings function as tools to be utilized, where most importantly it can be said that what makes Buddhism Buddhism is the fact that its doctrine is practice. That is, we cannot separate the Buddhist doctrine from Buddhist meditative experience simply because the doctrine is the path to enlightenment. As we know, the Sanskrit turn it refers to either experience or the scriptures. Thus, it, follow, it follows the veracity of teachings is to be affirmed in relation to one's own experience. And in this way, Buddhist doctrine relies on experiential knowledge. The scriptures have to confirm to our experience. Otherwise, they are said to be meaningless. We read them and we have to find out whether they make sense and then we relate them to our own experience to find out for the ourselves in this way. In this way, doctrine is applied and therefore turned into experience, wherein, as the Buddha's own experience attests to, spiritual experience lies in our actual living situation. It is an, uh, not other to it in some ephemer ephemeral otherworldly way. Thus, to be a Buddhist practitioner entails not only to know, i.e. have knowledge about, but also to be able to demonstrate the basis of one's knowing. The basis of knowing is in and through experience, through the practice of both intellectual and or analytical and meditative contemplative methods. Both are considered essential and one without the other is considered incomplete. In emphasizing the notion of lived experience, Buddhism thus presents as a first person perspective by looking directly at one's individual experience, that looking, informed by the scriptures, when applied to experience through study and contemplation, within a subjective world stabilized through meditation, reveals in fact that the scriptures are alive in experience and by, fi and by finding their truth in experience, they then become the experience of that individual, transforming who and how they are as a human, be human being and indeed through skillful means, how they are in turn experienced by others, furthering the notion that lived experience is in fact constituted in life through relation to others. This process describes the intimate relationship or indeed collapsing of doctrine and practice in which we ourselves are the practice. As a result, from a living tradition perspective, Buddhism must encompass the totality of human experience, that is in relation to content, so to speak, Buddhism can neither contain hypotheses or partial truths. It presents the whole truth of human experience, encompassing both what is and what could be. It thus distinguishes the lived experience of human beings in relation to the reality of the unenlightened individual and the reality of the, of the enlightened individual, in which reality here is understood as the world given in such experiences through mind. Therefore, the notion of lived experience creates an inclusive category in which both unenlightened, our delusory and our ordinary experiences and non-deluded or enlightened experience 
are categories of minds, of experiences, understood as available to human beings. Within this living tradition perspective, ordinary and, and enlightened experience can be described as unified in relation to being kinds of experiences of human beings and distinguished in relation, relation to representing different levels in which the capacity for human to beings to free themselves from suffering and to have, nature, is to have clarity as to the nature of their condition is represented by enlightenment. In this way, in Buddhism, experience is used in a wider sense, since it entails not only knowing what we already know or have experienced, but also, come, also includes what we will come to know and experience and the possibility of experiencing ourselves in ways we do not, do not know as yet and which we can aspire to know. Thus, the notion of singularity can be further detailed. Within the apparent plurality of Buddhism, distinguished by tradition, author, or concept, is reflected the singularity of seeking to understand in detail lived experience, now understood to encompass both ordinary and enlightened presentations, bearing witness to and holding responsibility towards the singular concerned with lived experience in these ways, creates an inclusive category to understand a human condition which serves to ground the experiential nature of spirituality and, uh, in our condition and widens the domain to include both those experiences we know and those we don't yet know, where in fact this notion of experience acts as an all-encompassing term incorporating the phenomena of our subjective world as human beings in which experience, knowledge, mind, reality, truth are all one in the same. Importantly, the context which both supports and directs the practitioner's experience is the teacher-student relationship, which is particularly emphasised in the Tibetan system, which I won't elaborate. However, the teacher-student relationship provides the fundamental basis to understand Buddhism as a tradition. In a sense, it is not merely a long-perpetuated custom. The teacher-student relationship is the form through which the Dharma has been practised by many since the Buddha, in which the teachings are transmitted by means of an unbroken lineage from person to person. From a living tradition perspective, each person in the lineage of teachers is understood to develop a self-understanding which adds to the tradition. Chogum Trumpa Rinpoche has described this process as like just handing down a recipe for bread. In each generation, the bread is exactly like the original bread, but possibly more flavourful because of the added experience of the bakers involved in the handing down. In each generation, he emphasises, however, the bread is fresh, delicious and healthy. Thus, as been outlined, Buddhism is derived, in, in, in the sense that Buddhism is derived from human experience, the notion of tradition here presents as a more elastic or malleable in the, in the way that we may appreciate it from a Western perspective, which since the time of the Enlightenment has seen tradition as a descriptor for habits or beliefs inconvenient to, to, or to virtually any innovation. Thus, in the West, traditional has served as the meaning opposite to modern, where tradition has come to signify belonging to a previous historical era, era. Someone who values tradition is seen as a conservative and out of touch. The continuation or adherence to a tradition has, is associated with ideas of custom, duty and respect. Traditions are often seen to be held on to for merely their own sake. Further, the notion of tradition sits in relation to that of modern in a series of oppositions within a basic past to present future dynamic which includes oppositions such as closed versus open, fate versus choice, external versus internal, um, control versus freedom. However, from the living tradition perspective, since the teachings are understood to always be up to date, to always reflect contemporary experience, since in the context of space and time, they are sourced in human experience and transmitted from person to person. They are not ancient wis wisdom, an old legend. The teachings are not passed along as information as a, ha as a grandfather might tell traditional tales to their, his grandchildren. It, it doesn't work in this way. Buddhism, as has been suggested, is real experience and thus must always, by necessity, be contemporary since this is, it's, it's, it is within our lived experience. Within the context of the theme of this conference, Buddhism Without Borders, a living tradition perspective serves to highlight the living quality Buddhism of Buddhism and emphasises that as a result it's applicable to every age, to every person. Furthermore, in contrast to often dominant Western perceptions, a living tradition perspective counters over determining the borders between the ancient and contemporary, between text and praxis, 
philosophy and lived experience, tradition and innovation. Buddhism, when reference to the singularity of lived experience, is in fact without borders, either temporal or geographic. By necessity, it engages with and through our contemporary world, reflecting that by its nature, Buddhism is alive to us each in our own experience. Thank you. Kuzuzampo and a very good evening to all our viewers. This is your weekly dose of Buddhism, the Chanchup Shing, and I'm your host for the next one hour, Karma Dendrup. Uh, for those of you who are watching this program for the first time, every week we in BBS Channel 2 bring to the audience venerable Buddhist masters, scholars, and practitioners live and whenever possible, and we have the audience clear their doubts and uh, questions. But this is a recorded program, so I would like to request our viewers to refrain from calling. Now. We have a very special guest on this episode of Chan Shub Shing, but before I introduce you to him, we would like to again convey our gratitude to the Center of Bhutan Studies for organizing an international conference on globalized Buddhism titled Buddhism Without Borders. Uh, now, without wasting any more time, our guest on this episode of Chan Shub Shing is uh, Mr. David McAdams. Welcome to our show. La. <laughs> Let me take a few moments to introduce uh, David to our viewers. Uh, David is a trained uh, physiotherapist uh, with a Master of Science degree. He is, currently, uh, he is currently the Allied Health Manager for Dorset Rehabilitation Services in Pasco Vale, uh, Melbourne, Australia. He is originally from Canada, but David moved to Melbourne in 1984, uh, and uh, he has been a Buddhist practitioner for the past 33 years, and uh, is a student of Tralek uh, Chabgin Rinpoche. Um, David, my first question to you, like to all the participants of this international conference, uh, I was speaking to you before the show and you shared with me that this is your first visit to Bhutan. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it won't be the uh, last. So could you share with us uh, how has the experience been? Oh, uh, um, I think it's been a very wonderful experience for me and uh, Bhutan is a very exciting and miraculous country and I've experienced um, very in, um, intense and relaxed at the same time experiences. So I don't really know how to put it into, into, into words, but it's a, other than it's a very miraculous place. And I've, my time here has been very special for me. Uh, uh, you work as a physiotherapist, and uh, you've been practicing Buddhism for over uh, three decades now. So how did you get introduced to Buddhism? How did this happen? First, I have to correct you a little bit. Um, I'm not a venerable. I've, I've, I'm a simple physiotherapist. I've practiced Buddhism according to the way my teachers have taught as best I can. Less. But, uh, but I have no more credentials than I've been a student of great teachers. Less. Less. Um, so starting in Buddhism, really, um, for a variety of reasons, I think most um, people of my age, of my time, felt a sense of dissatisfaction. And, and I didn't know really where to place that. And, and, and or where to apportion the responsibility for that. And so uh, I think m myself, I drifted around a bit as a young man. And, uh, but uh, then I heard um, uh, the Vidyadhara Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche speak one weekend. And uh, as he said, if you hear Dharma properly, it goes off like a gong in your head. And that's what happened to me. And so from then, I, I studied with him not with him in his centers. I met him a couple of times, uh, only like, you know, bowing and, and a couple of quick words. But I moved to Melbourne in 80, 1984, and then I met uh, the Venerable Chalak Kevlum of Vashay, and then I've been a student of his since that time. So um, from that conference, there were many scholars and there were practitioners also, mm. and they were sharing uh, one, uh, uh, one professor in particular was sharing about his experience of uh, practicing turning to Buddhism and the challenges that he faced in mm. that process. So could you, although it might be private, I can understand if you don't want to share uh, your experience with it, but I kind of, I, I find it uh, almost uh, similar to what so much of the youth of Bhutan right now are experiencing, what you were experiencing right. at that time right. uh, in the West. Uh. So I feel that it might be useful for our youth uh, viewers oh, who are okay. watching this program. So, so if you would be please. kind enough to share. So I think um, really for me, uh, the introduction of Buddhism was very liberating. So it was very exciting. And it gave me a sense of uh, optimism 
that I could deal with the difficulties of my life. So I think um, really that it wasn't hard to get into Buddhism. Um, but I ha did have obstacles at the time around me. Um, my ex-wife, who I have two children with, um, was not interested in Buddhism and found it somehow a bit childish or a bit... Um, she used to say that if you need these things, you must be a bit weak. You know, so she was didn't have a, a sense of what Buddhism the potential was, or really how it affected me. So there was an obstacle for me. I didn't stay very long with her after that. But for those five years, that was very hard to practice Buddhism in a f in a situation where there was no support for it. Mm -hmm. But um, still, I did, and and though it was difficult. Um, but then I guess over time things change, and then you meet, you can be with people who support Buddhism, and then it flowers. And uh, yourself, I mean, you were speaking about external uh, obstacles. Has there been any moment in uh, your experience uh, practicing Buddhism where you question yourself that oh, yes. in, maybe in the initial stages mm. where you feel that, oh, this is not really <coughs> happening for yes, me? Yes, true. I think... Um, and how did you overcome mm. those uh, obstacles? I think, you, first of all, you, uh, you, know, you do your practice because it's different. It, you aren't born into it in, in, in the West. You, you, you come to it and... Um, I practiced for a number of years only meditation. I didn't want to understand the, the, the Dharma properly. I wanted to just do meditation. I thought that was, that was the way forward. So I just practiced and practiced and practiced. And at some point, um, even though the teachers and the Buddhism, uh, Buddha Dharma clearly says you must match study and practice, you cannot have the two separate, uh, I didn't. You know. And after about four or five years, I just thought this doesn't make any sense. And then I actually then, was as I split from my ex-wife, there was a lot of turmoil. and. I just, it fell away for me for a while. I, about two, three years, I just wasn't interested in it. It didn't make any sense to me. And um, then my father got sick, and uh, it was a life-threatening illness. And um, I think when that happened, I, I had to reassess what I was really doing with my life. And uh, I then reconnected to, with Buddhism. I tried to keep Gimushi. didn't say anything when I went. When I came back, he didn't say anything when I came back. He left it up to me to decide what to do. And... Uh, because of that responsibility you take for yourself, then, I, then at, that, at that point, um, it was easy to come back because I was facing, again, obstacles again, difficulties. Um, this conference, uh, you were a participant. Uh, you were observing. Yes. And you didn't speak there. No. But uh, your experience of it, you <coughs> must have views and opinions. I mm. mean, uh, so could you share something about yes. the conference? I think... I think um, the idea of the conference w is a fantastic idea, and I think trying to send, um, make Buddhism a center for study is a very good idea, and, and uh, the Dasho's um, um, influence and guidance to bring it forth, I think, was, was, was really very special. I think, I think when you see, then when you, I think when you see the, all the academics who come, you really see, some, this, was a, this was one conference, not that I've been to many conferences on Buddhism, but uh, Kathleen has told me um, about her conferences. And um, very often you don't get many practitioners who are also scholars. At this conference, there was most people who were, were scholars had a practice of Buddhism. So I think that was very useful. And I think those who came to, to Bhutan did so because they had a real connection to Buddhism in, a, in a, a deep sense, not just an academic sense. So it was a very interesting conference. It was very wide-ranging, the ideas and the topics. Um, I, felt, I, I felt a little a, a bit of a fraud not being able to contribute. But, but I, I did, I did in, 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 in enjoy the, the topics, and they were very wide-ranging. Yes. Uh, uh, speaking of topics, in particular, the, theme, uh, the topic that they had kept for this conference, uh, Buddhism without borders, mm. your thoughts on that? Could you share something on that? Each, each, each person handled that very differently, some, some more, <coughs> more in, co in congruence with that, that idea and others less so. Um, not having prepared a paper, I didn't think I didn't think much about what that meant, Buddhism without borders. Um, but I think what I I think what, what what if there was a theme of the conference, what you saw was Buddhism from different parts of the world, and and that Buddhism has the has the capacity to pass beyond any kind of border, whether it be a geographical border like a mountain uh, mountain uh, peaks or um, national lines, and still find fertile soil and still grow very, very strong traditions, uh, and still, even though you might, they may not look very similar from the first, first uh, looking at, uh, but when you examine them a bit, you really see that they, they have uh, the capacity to change human beings and to bring their lives you know, forth. Uh, your wife, uh, Kathleen, yes. who was a guest on our show, 
we are the past episode of Chan Jushin. We spoke about her topic, and I'm sure uh, you must have had some thought about the topic that she had chosen to speak yes, about. Yes, we talked a bit. So Buddhism as a living tradition, and the <coughs> fact that in Bhutan she commented on the fact that she finds it like like the tradition is still alive here and uh, of course she was speaking about in the western context and everywhere that buddhism mm. itself is it, it it is alive mm. uh, uh, mm. a philosophy that is alive mm. and breathing so uh, your, do you have any thoughts or comments that you would like to make on that topic oh yeah i think probably many uh, first in the practical sense of being in bhutan i've tried to every morning if i've been near a stupa i've tried to get up early to go with the other practitioners and, and circumambulate and, and do some prostrations and do some prayers and do some meditation. And, um, every day you started fantastic like that. You know, so the fact that you, we have a stupa close by that we can visit is really um, wonderful for me. And I think um, in the last episode, Kathleen talked about a friend of ours who was a very strong practitioner. She was on three retreats twice. And uh, she was saying only six months ago, before I'd even really heard about Bhutan coming here, I knew about Bhutan, but had not the thought of coming here. She was saying that she hungered so much for a, a place where um, the living tradition was, she could see it everywhere. She could see us too. And very funny, it's as if she saw our future. Six months later, suddenly we're in a place where, that's, where that, that takes place. And, and I can go back and tell her that it really is very inspiring. And, and, and uh, it fills you for a real, real um, sense of, of happiness all the time. Now, uh, getting into your uh, professional life as a physiotherapist, uh, is there, how does Buddhism help you <coughs> in your work? Does it help you? I mean, uh, sure. I be, well, I became a Buddhist before I, I trained as a physiotherapist. As I said, I went through a period of not being very settled. So, um, and I think I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew from the little contact with Buddhism I had that I wanted to be somehow working with people. I wasn't even sure how that would take place or, or whether I had, you know, big plans for, you know, being very helpful, but I knew that. That was what I needed to do. I needed to be with working with people because that was so challenging, and and I knew that I needed a challenge to to develop. Um, so Buddhism is important for me, really personally. I I, it's, I can't bring it into my into my work in the sense of teaching Buddhism, although we do some meditation, we do some mindfulness practices, um, but for me it helps me to see the people that I see, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that maybe later. But they're, they're very. Um, downtrodden and depressed. They're very debilitated and consequently they're very hard to be with and, and no one wants to be with them really and they don't want to be with themselves either. So, but Buddhism helps me to be refreshed with them, to, to remind myself that e every being has an opportunity to practice love and compassion and so without that I think you could not do that work. You become more and more de um, either disliking of the people or rejecting of the people. As judgmental. Judgmental and it's very easy to be that with that group because they're really struggling, and I think they, a clean slate every morning to start with. And then every time I, I see someone, I try to remember something like that. You know, every person you know is time to practice a little bit with them. When I was speaking to Kathleen, I was uh, talking to her about uh, youth-related problems in Bhutan, mm. and unemployment being one of that. And uh, another point which I'd uh, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss with you is the fact that uh, Bhutan, although now we are getting into career counseling and other sorts of guidance counseling, also uh, during my time it was almost not there and uh, the fact that what I observe what I have personally observed is in the West uh, people take their time to choose a profession mm. and most often they go for a profession that they want to do so there's yes. passion involved and right. like that I don't know <coughs> I, it's mm. Confucius who said that that choose your job well and you don't have to work for a single day of your life ah, so it's beautiful. Along those lines, if uh, for the viewers, for because this program is uh, actually uh, specifically targeted mm. for the uh, youth audience, mm. although, I mean, uh, not saying that other people are not allowed to yes, watch this program, yes. but uh, if you could share something about physiotherapy, mm. uh, I'm, I take it that you do love your job, or it, it's something that, mm. uh, can you share with our sure. uh, youth audience about what this job is sure. and how uh, it benefits you. Okay, so the, so the job is, is really, um, because their problems are so profound and they're so widespread, they've usually lost their job or on the, on the way to losing their job. They've often rocky with their relationship and on the way to losing that or, or compromise with that. Um, physically very weakened, um, psychologically depressed. Um, so the lowest ebb possible. So um, our work really is to, is to try to find a place for them to start in, in the physiotherapist perspective 
can they begin an exercise routine that starts with walking? Simple walking, simple stretching, we then move into something that might allow them to participate more fully in exercise and activity. Really, it's really activity-based. Can we get them to do things? The occupational therapist tries to make those activities meaningful, so sub substantial things that are, are important in their life. Looking after themselves, looking after their, their um, house inside and outside. And if they can't work, can they look at some kind of volunteer work, some way to bring themselves back into the community? Because usually they've gone back into the house completely. And the psychologists are working really to help them with those very negative thoughts, negative perceptions of the world, and can they somehow um, transform them into a more positive outlook. Uh, just a follow-up on this question. If you were trying to convince me to be a physiotherapist, oh. what would you tell me about oh. physiotherapy that might convince me to become a physiotherapist? Hmm. Because uh, now that I've moved into an area a little different to physiotherapy, it, it reuses those same principles, but it's not in the same way. I think, so uh, someone who wants to be a physiotherapist really has to, I think, they want to work with their hands, not just their mind. They want to have a, a because it's a very physical job, you want to be able to uh, work with your hands with other people skillfully. So it takes some psychology in terms of motivation and helping people to, to problem solve things. But you want to, to really use your hands in, a, in an effective way with people. And uh, now, uh, another question that I have in regard to your, uh, your work is, uh, Bhutan also has a budding physiotherapy section uh, department in- and, I've heard uh, of it. Yes, yes. In the hospital here in Thimpu. So for uh, from uh, hearing what you were sharing about how challenging the work is, the kind of uh, patients that you have mm. to deal with, is there uh, like an advice or something that you've learned on the job that you can share uh, with our Bhutanese uh, physiotherapists? Okay. Um, I think the most important thing is is to not rely on the machines, not to not rely on those those modern things. You really have to to learn to diagnosis, you have to learn to treat effectively, and you have to learn to help the person follow that up. So, the the important thing is not hot packs and this and that, which comes which which really, interesting enough, the machines are less and less a part of physiotherapy. Even though you go to conferences, there's a huge amount of machines. The physiotherapists who are really skillful looking, are looking at diagnosis, effective treatment, and e effective exercise prescription. So doing those things is much more important than slapping a machine on. Yeah. Yes. Um, now coming to the patients, uh, and I had a similar question which I had uh, asked uh, Kathleen also. Is there an experience or a patient uh, or, or which, which has been like a life learning experience for you? Something that uh, you remember mm. or you mm. reflect upon? Mm. I think there are many. If you would be so kind as to think of one. <laughs> one or... Uh, um, well, I can maybe... I, I, I think I can use one person as, as an example, but generally people, uh, many people I see have English as a second language, so they've come to Australia with very high expectations of what life will, will offer for them. The job they get is not the job they trained for. They may have been a very highly trained teacher or medical person or professional in, in whatever country they come from. Often, lately, it's been the Middle East. And they come to Australia, and they're lifting bags of things. And their back hurts. and, and uh, um, So it's v for them, their expectations are not met by the world that they, that they encounter. And they become very upset and very and they, tyrannical in their, in their pursuit of justice, you know. But the, really, it's... You know, justice is a hard thing for them, anyone to find. Um, and every once in a while, you know, you, you see someone that comes in and he's 50 years old and he's been trained and, and you think there's just no hope. You know, he's never going to make this jump. And I remember one man very recently who was uh, from the, I think it was from Afghanistan, but he might have been from Iraq. And, uh, for, you know, he, he had all the complaints. You know, the, medic, the, doc, the doctors have not helped me, the work has not helped me, I'm alone, I'm, you know, I'm losing my job, and, and, and for some reason, just, he took the information on that we had and he, he used it himself. And so we don't, we don't do that much. We can give some advice, but we can't do that for them. And for some reason, he, within a couple of months, he did some volunteer work. He was dressing himself properly. He was walking every day. He, was not, he wasn't pain-free, he wasn't cured by any means, but, but suddenly, you know, he just found it within himself to, to take the information on and let let go of this resentment that he had for the way he had been treated. So, and I guess that's what the good part of the work, but very few people are able to do that successfully. Yes. Some can. I always ask this question to lamas and teachers, but I ask this question because many people, I mean, different people have different answers for it. So 
given your three decades of uh, practicing experience, uh, to you, who was or is the Buddha or what is the Buddha? Mm. If you could be so kind as to <laughs> share that with us. Okay. I think if we go back to the living tradition, and, and for me, I wasn't interested in the Buddha as much as the teacher who taught me. And, it, and, and so my teacher now is Chalai Kyabgon, and because he's, he is part of a living tradition, his lineage goes back to the time of the Buddha, and, and a, a true living tradition can, teacher can do that. So if you have a teacher like that, then, then his words and his teaching are, are the same as the Buddha's. And of course, he, he always refers back to the Buddha and his references to the Buddha and to his teachers. So it's not like he's saying he's the Buddha, but our, our, you know, my, my sense is he's the Buddha. He's not saying that. Um, so you're saying uh, the teacher is the Buddha to you? Or because my to, teacher is. Because to yeah. rephrase it, actually, uh, my question, we, I had the good fortune of get, uh, getting an audience with His Holiness in Bodh Gaya in my visit down there. Yes. And what I found remarkable and which stays with me is uh, he was speaking to a Bhutanese audience. He was speaking in Tibetan, of course. Right. And the first thing he said was he spelled out the word Buddha in Tibetan. Sang asa, sang ragata ga gaeta ja sa je. And uh, we pronounce it Sangye here. The yes. Tibetans pronounce it Sanje. Yes. But he was saying, what does that mean to you? And he was speaking to an audience of uh, mostly uh, who haven't had formal education. Mm. So he was saying, as a Buddhist, uh, he was saying the first question that you should ask yourself is the Buddha. Mm. Who is the Buddha or mm. what is the Buddha? Mm. So uh, going by that, I mean, if you have another uh, answer or I could go with the fact that for you, the teacher is the Buddha. Okay. Which, so, is, which still adds a variety sure, to my archive sure. of <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think um, what has been emphasized through the teachings that I've received in, is, is that, um, you know, the Buddha did these, the Buddha is a human, he was born a human, he died a human, um, even though in the Tang traditions those things, you know, they stretch out a little bit in time and space, but still, his concern was human being, human development, and I think um, so. When I before I was a, before I was a Buddhist, I had a sense that 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 what we had to do was 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 to become as uh, perfect something about our human beingness. I had a sense of that. I didn't know what that meant, and I think the the Buddha did that. He he was able to take the raw materials of his experience, and he was able to perfect himself and to become a Buddha. So I think the sense of of the of, of I don't mean perfection in the sense uh, of, of um, precision, but somehow to perfect the human beingness. That, that, that's what the Buddha was saying, and that's what the Buddha is. Okay. Um, the Buddha Dharma, um, I ask this question to all my guests also, and of course there's 84,000 volumes of mm -hmm. the Kanjur and the mm. Tenjur, but uh, to you, with your vast experience, um, what is the Buddha Dharma to you? I think vast is the wrong word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just over time, okay. you know, over time. Um, and because um, uh, the Venerable Chala Kyomgon, he teaches retreats a couple times a year, he gives a course a couple times a year, so every, year, every retreat he teaches a different topic. So, ev and every year I try to practice a little bit on that topic. So this year, um, it's bodhicitta. So that's what my practice at the moment is, thinking about bodhicitta and... Um, I, I listen to his, I ride my bicycle to work, I listen to his teachings, no, not every day, but, but every do, some days every week. Mm -hmm. And then I try to go over those, those things. So at the moment, uh, the teachings of the Mahayana and Bodhicitta are what are most important at the moment for me. Um, one of the guests on Chan Jup Shing was His Eminence Dzogchen Panlo Vimoche, and he has a very interesting take on the six parameters, and uh, generosity and uh, mm. so forth. Are you familiar with the six parameters? A, a little bit, yes. So, so it, has that ever been a practice in your life? Or um, in a formal sense, I, I've read about them and, and I've tried to make some sense of them. Um, so, I mean, certainly, uh, um, actually, Zolzhen Chong Ponlop came to Melbourne back in the 90s, and yeah. we, we, I heard him speak there. He's a very, very good teacher, very interesting teacher. And he, I think he has a sense in my hometown, yeah. Vancouver. Mm. Yes, sir, there. Yes, yes. So, so I have a connection to him in a funny way that I've. That, 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 um, so the six parami parameters in terms of understanding the implications, um, I have some experience. That I don't know what I, if I can answer that in a way that's, that that says more than what they are. Mm. Okay. 
Um, I'll, I have another question for you, but uh, given the fact that, I don't know, uh, the secret mantrayana, if you would, it would be a breach of that uh, tamsik or vows, but uh, maybe you could be, you could safely answer my question sure. as in the bodhicitta, the, the teaching that uh, Tralek Chapgun is uh, mm. teaching you right now. Mm. Uh, how, how is that working out for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, really, uh, I mean, so he's, on the retreat he was teaching about the relative bodhicitta. Okay. How, how is it in terms of human affairs? How, how, how can you generate bodhicitta through um, and practicing every day how you would do that? So reflecting on your connection to people, the connection to the teachings, all the things that make a good human life. Yes. Uh, trying to re reflect daily about the fact that, that um, there's a benefit to bodhicitta. What is the benefit? Yes. There's a benefit. There's a there's a there's a, a difficulty with being disconnected from bodhicitta. It's important to practice every day some amount. He's, he said six times a day. Try to bring bodhicitta to mind six times a day. Yes. If you could share something about how Rinpoche was instructing you to go oh, about okay. it. So so what I've been, what I remember what he teaches is different two different things. Yes. But but uh, um, so the most uh, the way I've used it the most in Bhutan is as I've been walking to the stupa I've been thinking about what is to be created in a country where the living tradition. So I'm connected to the Puiva Bhutan. I'm connected to the geography and the, the, the architecture of Bhutan. I think of my job, I have connected to physiotherapists all over the world. So trying to remember all the interconnections, trying to remember um, that I have, I have had loving parents, I have children, I have good friends, I have a steady job, I have an income. So trying to keep in mind those connections as I walk to the stupa, trying to keep that in, in the mind. Interdependency or yeah, the connectedness. Yes, yeah. um, would you be? Uh, would you like to share some uh, previous teachings also that you shared with Rinpoche? <laughs> like uh, it's very interesting, the fact that uh, you are training right now in Bodhicitta. Does any other past uh, teachings come to mind? Ah, you, oh, I mean Rinpoche. T Rinpoche uh, um, he spent five years in Eastern Bhutan in a monastery there as a young man, I think in the seventies, and he had a, a Nima teacher there who was um, a, a very great tantric. Practitioner, and uh, so he also uh, fell in love with Long um, Rabjem Longjem Longchempa's teachings. I, I know as Longchempa, no, I think Rabjem Long Rabjem Longchen. Uh, so Long he Chen Rabjempa. Longchen Rabjempa. Okay, yes. sorry. So he he has translated many of his some of his texts quite oh. often for years with us. And so even though I can't bring one to mind, but he's I've been exposed to to Longchempa's texts through Rinpoche and. Um, so there's that aspect of 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 of, uh, of, of uh, the tantric because you asked you about the tantric yes. uh, and, and uh, what I notice about Rinpoche is is that um, he's always skillfully working with people in ways that are hard to you don't understand why he says what he says or or but you follow or why he says what he says to you but sometime later it makes some sense so you, you can trust that even though it might seem very peculiar and hard to understand. His motivation is is both relative and ultimate combined. So he sees how we will, you know, we will develop if we if we look at this way. So he he's leading us along in development through through his behavior, through his teachings, and through the, how the center is set up. Yes. Um, have you um, had any experience with um, uh, youth? Uh, or, or somebody who is recovering mm. from substance abuse or, mm. or a youth practitioner in mm. your uh, center? Mm. Yes. yes. Actually, the youth are the most difficult to work with. Yes. And is there anything that you can share with us? Yeah, I think, I think often um, the youth are, uh, uh, who come to the center, they really have no, nothing to fall back on. So in the, in, that may not be true here. But they have no discipline to fall back onto. They have no sense of themselves of, as with confidence to fall back onto. So when they have an injury that's a bit, that can be catastrophic at an early age, they really have very little capacity, and they're actually not much interested in, in what we have to say. <laughs> they just want to do their own thing, yes. and and doesn't lead them in a very good direction. So those who do well um, are able, if they can call in some discipline from the past and some some values from the past, and 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 then apply themselves slowly. Um, Okay, coming back to the uh, Bud uh, to Buddhist to Buddhism, um, the Guru Shishya tradition of the teacher and the student. Yes. You were speaking to us about uh, how you uh, see Tralak uh, Rinpoche yes. uh, working with his students. Yes, and uh, in a way, the Buddha also does teach that in saying that 
I mean, even the words of the perfect teacher says to actually analyze your root group yes, before yes, you yes, actually become yes. his followers. So in the West and with your experience, um, how is that tradition? I mean, is it the same as in there is no, I mean, is there a, a, a no questioning aspect to it or uh, are there more, are they more skeptical, mm. more? I think, I think in the West generally, students are in, encouraged to ask as many questions as possible. Um, and I think early on in Rinpoche's life, you know, he was flooded with questions. And I think um, as he's got older, I, I, I don't know, things have changed. And I don't know what, why they have changed, but, but he invites fewer questions, but he sets up more of the environment for people to learn in. So he, even though the course questioning and, and is, is encouraged and being, and trying to, I think skeptical is, is, is a really misused word, in, especially in the West, because people think skeptical means to um, be skeptical about everything else but yourself. Whereas my understanding is Buddhism is saying, be skeptical of the, of the mind you have and the way it's developing. Like you should look at that. That's, that's to, you should be skeptical about, not whether the teacher is a good or a bad teacher, or you know. But look at the connections you're making in your mind. That that's what you need to be m most skeptical about. And um, so I think Rinpoche has gone to, to from being very open, like open smoker's board, and everyone, everything comes to him. To now he's we don't see as much of him, but he sets up the environment so the people who enter into his, his, his this practice environment, they learn inside the environment. He doesn't have to do all the teaching now. Um, would you have a message to fellow Bhutanese uh, Buddhist practitioners or anything that you would like mm. to say to the Bhutanese audience? Um, I, th I think you don't need a lot, to, <laughs> lot more than what you have. You know, you have a, a wonderful country, it's going, it's old and new at the same time, it's, 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 it's rich, it's got poverty, the same. it's got many things happening, you don't need a lot more. You know, you, so, um, I think for me coming in into this environment is it's so inspiring, you know. And and uh, I hope that the Bhutanese don't feel that there's something else better over the over the border somewhere else that will be better for them, more inspiring. I don't think there will be. They may have more material wealth. They may have uh, uh, others, m maybe more satisfactory work sometimes. And that's probably important to have a satisfactory work. But uh, but there's not much more you have to do in terms of your uh, um, spiritual life. Uh, speaking about uh, the other side, I mean, surprisingly, our older generation who have hardly traveled beyond the borders mm -hmm. are very happy in, in, in Bhutan. It's, there is a kind of uh, dissatisfaction when it comes to the youth yeah, who I'm actually sure. have traveled ab abroad. And uh, me personally, to, uh, oh. to share something personally, I love it here also. But uh, for the youth who, mm. who are, um, you could say, westbound or yes, so... Yes. Uh, enamored by yes. uh, other yes. cultures, a final uh, message sure, from. Sure. Uh, I think youth. you should you should go to those places and you find out for yourself. Because if you think it's better, no point sitting around here trying to you waiting. But go and find out because you'll find out that it. I think you'll find that that uh, uh, there are good things about the West. There are difficult things, and you will make a good life for yourself there. But you may also want to hunger to come back home too. But go and find out. That's the best thing. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. David, and I, our production team wishes you a pleasant stay here in Bhutan thank and you. we wish to host you again in the future. I hope so. Yes. Thank you. Yes. From everybody here at Chuba Chu and from me, your host, Karma Dendrup, uh, thank you for watching. Good night. And please don't forget our slogan, Analyze and Realize. Mm -hmm.